actually do migrations. So Linux IO internals for PostgreSQL administrators. Uh, what, what is new, how it works, uh, how interesting it is. Uh, could you tell me please, uh, who runs uh, Postgres on Linux? Oh, <laughs> uh, that's why you're probably here. <laughs> uh, does anyone use Windows uh, for Postgres? Okay, uh, interesting. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll see. Uh, at least if you run Postgres on Windows, it's doable, but uh, probably it's a good idea to switch to Linux, but it's up to you. Uh, so uh, Linux IO internals. Um, why uh, this? Uh, talk is uh, uh, quite uh, maybe important for you. Uh, so um, Linux is most common operating system for databases. And uh, this is interesting fact, but now it's mainstream because of many reasons. Uh, despite of, uh, for example, in Postgres community, uh, FreeBSD was very popular and is very popular, but uh, you know, um, Linux uh, somehow became uh, a big push because many database vendors w were contributing uh, to it to improve uh, a lot of uh, performance related things like huge pages, uh, recent kernel improvements and so on and so on. So es essentially uh, now it's uh, the best operating system for uh, databases uh, than we are speaking about performance. Uh, and well, that's why. Uh, and for uh, database workloads, fast input-output is essential, uh, and probably input-output problems are most uh, common performance problems in many ways. I don't know um, who uh, hit any performance problems related to I/O last week. Okay, uh, last two weeks. Yeah, it's. Pretty much very significant, so uh, that's why um, it's important to understand this. Um, but problem is, uh, most of the information on topic is written by kernel developers for kernel developers. Uh, so uh, you know, many of them can speak, <laughs> many of them can do beautiful talks about this, but uh, those are not entry level talks. And my uh, idea here is to provide you some. Uh, starting knowledge uh, in order to encourage you to Google yourself, to use different resources, uh, to learn more about this. Uh, this particular conference is especially interesting about the topic because there are uh, people who know about this uh, more than me. Uh, and I would uh, give you, at the end of this talk, uh, some clues where to go and uh, what to attend if you want to learn more. Uh, and uh, another reason is why I put the date on the slides, uh, on, in the title. Um, last year's development is uh, very fast since uh, uh, Linux moved from uh, kernel 2 to kernel 3. Uh, the pace of development increased quite drastically. Uh, that is good and uh, that is complicated because you need to learn new things. Uh, uh, however, those things are, became easier for database administrators. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, one of the uh, side notes here, uh, you probably want to use a relatively recent kernel uh, to get all, the, uh, all those fancy things. So uh, we would uh, speak uh, how our database interacts with input-output, um, and uh, we will uh, evolutionary uh, uh, take uh, some small picture of uh, how uh, input-output stack in Linux evolved over recent years, and uh, I will cover a couple of things which are new and give some advices uh, what you want to use. So, um, well, very typical database. Uh, however, Postgres today is maybe not that typical in this regard. Uh, uses uh, some memory, uh, and this memory is uh, uh, like uh, divided between uh, Postgres and uh, Linux kernel. So Postgres use so-called buffered I.O. Uh, there were reasons behind that uh, uh, decision. Uh, some people say the idea was uh, just to keep uh, the things uh, 
compatible with most of uh, operating systems and let operating system to do the job. Uh, today, it's probably uh, not that uh, modern anymore, but anyway, uh, we uh, deal with that. And the idea is uh, we have uh, our data files, pages uh, on the disk, and we move them to shared memory through page cache, so we need to uh, copy them uh, from the disk to um, uh, Linux kernel buffer, and then we need to copy them to shared buffers from where we can access them. And uh, everything uh, happens in user space. Uh, page cache of Linux kernel is in kernel space. We do not have access. Uh, we, we cannot just pick up the page from here without uh, copying them to shared buffers. Uh, and the same thing with uh, write-ahead log buffer. So we need to uh, populate the specific buffer for uh, write-ahead log, and then we synchronize that to disk uh, in order to keep all, all our transactions safe. Uh, and uh, it's theoretically it's easier than we only uh, read the data. So we basically uh, our uh, application sends a SQL query, and uh, uh, we ask uh, our database to uh, get something from the disk, put it into the page cache, and then to shared buffers, and then we can relatively easily operate uh, with this uh, data. So um, latency of the disk is generally uh, much uh, higher than a latency of the memory, uh, you know, and uh, our idea is always to heat up the cache. So most of our data is supposed to be uh, uh, cached in shared buffers, and if we manage that, everything works much better. Uh, but if we write, uh, the problem could be much more complex, because if we write, uh, some of our pages, uh, those are read here, uh, they are so-called dirty pages. So if we change any tuple inside uh, this uh, page, even one tuple, uh, the entire page is marked as dirty, and we need to do special handling uh, about this because um, we have then inconsistent disk image. So our data files are inconsistent with the state of our memory, and that's a problematic situation. If we shut down the server, memory goes down, and everything... Uh, is lost. Uh, that's why we have those specific mechanisms with uh, write-ahead log, and our write-ahead log uh, does the following. Uh, before it returns to our application, uh, it synchronizes uh, some redo information uh, with the file on the disk, uh, and we are relatively safe. Uh, but still, we have uh, information we need to recover in our write-ahead log, but our shared memory is inconsistent to our disk. And that's, that's a problem. Why we do so? Why we do not put that directly on the disk? Uh, because uh, it would be very an easy operation to do that just in place. We need uh, to go over the entire database. We need to figure out uh, how to write it. Uh, it's much easier uh, in terms of uh, performance to write write ahead log, which is like sequential uh, write uh, into the file, uh, and um, do not take care about those inconsistency because like we keep a track, uh, and from time to time we need to synchronize this thing. We do not do that after each transaction. That that's why our transaction uh, transaction only need to wait uh, for input output or write ahead log. Uh, and from time to time, specific processes uh, are responsible to synchronize those things uh, to the disk. And uh, this is already a complex uh, thing, uh, and we need, uh, about, uh, we need to think about high performance input output uh, uh, in this regard. So uh, what are additional challenges? Uh, shared memory segment, or shared buffers, for example, in modern databases, we, we used to tell uh, people like, oh, you have a nice server, 32 gigs of RAM uh, 10 years ago. Now, uh, 32 gigs of RAM, uh, maybe, <laughs> I'm not sure, <laughs> maybe this one. Uh, Devrim definitely have half a terabyte on his laptop as RAM, uh, I'm sure. Uh, and, uh, mm, well, um, all those things became very challenging because uh, what's the benefit of having a lot of uh, shared memory for a database? Uh, we can keep a lot of things in the cache and we can access that cache very fast. Uh, but 
at the same point, we produce a lot of dirty pages if we have all TP workload. And our uh, large segment of shared memory is full of dirty pages. Uh, so then we try to synchronize them to the disk. Uh, we uh, hit the serious problem of input-output because if we have half terabyte of RAM on the machine, uh, even we have 25% of that for shared buffer, uh, then 25% for kernel buffer, uh, we have a pretty impressive amount of uh, uh, data to be written to the disks. And for example, uh, if we put like old fashioned disk uh, into such machine, our input output would be, would be just overwhelmed. Uh, you can experiment with that yourself, just uh, you can uh, use uh, some Amazon EC2 uh, cloud machine uh, with half a terabyte memory and try to put the general purpose uh, EBS disks in, in, in that uh, and try to do some input output. It would be like very horrible. Your disk would be utilized 100% uh, of the time. Um, and uh, yeah, we need to write everything including wall uh, fast and safe uh, and uh, the problem is we could not optimize only one part. We could not uh, put a lot of memory and uh, uh, chip disk. We could not just put chip disk and uh, uh, do not provide enough memory. So all the parts of this input-output stack should be uh, really good optimized. Um, so in case of Postgres, um, most uh, input-output usually is generated by uh, this synchronization, uh, also called as checkpoint spikes, uh, and many people really experience it that. So uh, this is the main source of input-output we need to afford. Uh, also, auto vacuum can generate uh, a lot of input-output. If we change in uh, data frequently, um, and we have lots of auto vacuum workers, and they have lots of things to do, they also can uh, contribute to this input-output uh, figures quite dramatically. Um, besides of this, then we, for example, restart our database or do some large bulk operations. Uh, we need to refill our cache. Um, despite this is just read operation, it could uh, consume a lot of input-output capacity of our disks. Uh, and don't forget that from time to time we need to do uh, source, um, uh, hashing, uh, and so on uh, in our uh, workers. You can all see that on the explain analyze uh, that uh, sometimes they uh, go to disk. Uh, we want usually to avoid this because uh, um, this operation should be uh, done uh, in memory to be fast. But in some analytical databases, uh, those operations could be so monumental that they still uh, using disk for that. Uh, okay, so the main IO problem is uh, for a long time it was how to maximize throughput. Uh, and uh, all the things like from disk to memory to CPU to IO schedulers to file system, database itself were involved. Because, you know, if you have uh, one single processor on the machine and uh, uh, some process is waiting for the disk, uh, probably uh, your processor would be also busy waiting on that. Now we have lots of processors, uh, now we have uh, faster disks, uh, so um, uh, our input-output problems were not always about the disks, but finally disks are quite important here. Um, and. Uh, the problem why disks are so important is because uh, for a long time and still uh, the latency of the disks was much uh, uh, larger, uh, much much higher than uh, uh, than other parts. So basically, memory was always quite fast, uh, and uh, there is a fundamental thing between throughput and latency. So uh, m we can maximize. Uh, our IO performance uh, through maximizing throughput. Uh, but uh, what is maximizing throughput? We can like put a lot of disks, we can put a lot of different things. Uh, but at some point, we, uh, we need to uh, minimize latency because like it's, it's last mile problem. We uh, maximize throughput, we invented some effective uh, algorithms how to sort input-output things. But at some point, uh, latency became tricky. Uh, and uh, then uh, we actually got 
uh, proper SSDs, and a typical characteristic of SSD is uh, it's fast, but uh, also is important that it's uh, high parallel capable. So comparing to classical disks, uh, mechanical disk, SSD can do many, many things uh, in, uh, in parallel. And this uh, degree of parallelity is uh, very high. Uh, and at, at this point, uh, it turns out that input-output stack in Linux uh, should be massively overhauled. Uh, and uh, besides of this, uh, the problem uh, is for many, many years, database development, as, is, as uh, the Linux kernel development, was highly concentrated about uh, optimizing things for rotating disks. We all remember, like, uh, should we use uh, Stripe or Mirror, uh, which is fast, uh, how many uh, seeks do, uh, does the head, and so on and so on. Uh, in era of SSDs, most of those things are quite useless, and uh, many of them are actually uh, um, um, wrong to uh, use with SSDs. So, um, very simplified picture of input-output stack, uh, including our database. So we have database memory, uh, and we have options what to do. We have a uh, virtual file system. We use typically X4 uh, these days. Uh, and um, we have two options. We can uh, theoretically use direct I.O., or we can use uh, page cache, uh, so buffer it I.O. Uh, and Postgres use buffer it I.O. Uh, then we go through all those caches uh, from all those layers. We um, uh, go to the so-called block I.O. layer. And this block I.O. layer is uh, designed to uh, like, uh, put together all our requests with all the pages from memory to the disk and form a so-called input-output request. Uh, and uh, through a bio layer, we go to the request layer. Uh, and uh, in the request layer, we form so-called uh, vectors of, of the request. So we build vectors of uh, pages, uh, which should be written through the driver to the disks. And in um, old good times of rotating disks, uh, that was usually like uh, we try to form those vectors uh, in that regard that it would be like placed together and could be written with a single move of uh, head of rotating disk. Uh, and then we finally reach uh, the disk and everything is written. Uh, and um, the idea is uh, that uh, at some point we need to move from pages, which are, which, which are typical uh, thing for memory, to cylinder sectors and those things which SCSI driver is operating. And that was like main goal of those uh, elevators, IO schedulers, and things like this. Uh, in old times of old kernels, uh, there was so-called Linus elevator, uh, and uh, this thing was uh, horrible. <laughs> it didn't work, uh, and um, uh, some people were telling that, okay, uh, that's so useless, we, we do not bother to, to develop it anymore because nobody wants to, to, to use like this sort of input-output scheduling. Uh, but it turns out that it was so useful that people try to do uh, more sophisticated mechanisms. And uh, before ver early versions of uh, third Linux kernel, a uh, bunch of uh, different schedulers um, arrived. And the idea was uh, complete uh, fair queuing, like default scheduling, which probably was better optimized for desktop workload, not for the database thing. Then you have like very random workload and so on. Uh, then was uh, the idea of deadline uh, scheduler uh, with rotating disks. And this deadline scheduler was uh, so designed uh, like every uh, output uh, operation uh, has its own deadline when it should happen and uh, the uh, vector is uh, resorted if this deadline arrives. So basically, uh, y y have you ever been in inefficient airport on the security control? So then the, uh, the guy uh, goes around and says, uh, whose plane is leaving in 15 minutes? Uh, and then uh, he moves the, those people in front and 
as a result, all the people need to wait maximum time. So it's basically a deadline scheduler explained in uh, uh, terms of airport security. Uh, it was very suboptimal. Uh, and that's why then uh, uh, SSDs, like modern SSDs, starting to arrive. Uh, there was an idea of so-called noob or none scheduler. Uh, and basically, this scheduler was uh, doing nothing. It was substituting uh, default CFQ and uh, was not doing any clever tweaks uh, with uh, sorting input-output optimally. Because for uh, SSDs, in that way, we can gain actually better performance. Uh, and... Uh, people immediately started to use that with disk arrays and uh, SSDs. Uh, after version 3.13, uh, actually development increased very drastically uh, and uh, uh, was introduced completely new concept, uh, so-called uh, bulk MQ scheduler, which is not uh, completely a scheduler. It's actually a, a big rework of uh, entire input output layer and it's completely different philosophy it is an uh, input output driver which comes together with uh, NVMe uh, driver and it's al already designed and uh, third with, uh, with the ideas of SSD so basically it was a first attempt to do uh, Linux aware of how high parallel input output with uh, modern SSDs uh, and uh, since even uh, early versions of a third uh, uh, Linux kernel, uh, it started to be like default option for, uh, for using with um, SSDs. And on the modern kernels, like for, for something or whatever you use right now, most likely if uh, the disks are presented to your operating system as NVMe, uh, they would use uh, bulk MQ as a default. Um, so what is the idea? There was an old uh, approach to the operators. So basically there was uh, elevator queue and uh, because our disk driver was uh, not parallel capable, uh, it was an idea like to serialize data. Um, we have lots of processors, we have lots of things, but basically we need to serialize everything into single queue because SD driver uh, cannot understand uh, uh, many inputs. And uh, that was an old approach. Uh, more new approach is uh, depending on uh, how many CPUs we have, uh, basically each CPU can have uh, its own input output queue. Uh, and then it <coughs> goes to the mm, sorry uh, it goes to the disks uh, and because of that we can actually achieve much better uh, disk performance because all these parallel capa uh, uh, capacities of the SSDs would be utilized. Uh, well, um, it's one of the reasons why uh, the thing started to be quite fast and efficient. Uh, but another thing is uh, that NVMe as well is like very close to CPU, so basically uh, uh, it sits uh, directly on the bus and uh, there is not a lot of hops between that. But um, actually from this development, uh, not only like directly attach NVMe uh, benefit, uh, also disk arrays, uh, controllers, uh, could benefit from that, and uh, the manufacturers of uh, disk arrays controllers uh, contributed to NVMe uh, quite significantly. Uh, and also, uh, currently, uh, you can actually use bulk MQ even for uh, SCSI attached uh, SSDs. Uh, currently, uh, it, it started to uh, to do this. It, it's not uh, that easy and transparent like with uh, NVMe because NVMe by default pick ups uh, everything right and you don't need to do anything. Um, but basically you need to do some tweaks with uh, Grub uh, to recognize um, the uh, SCSI attached SSD device and put the uh, proper uh, driver and uh, proper input output scaler there. So uh, new stack with bulk MQ looks like uh, this. So basically, uh, entire layer is uh, totally overhauled, and bulk MQ substituted all those uh, old school layers. Uh, 
all through uh, there are a couple of uh, input output schedulers uh, which are introduced with uh, bulk MQ. Um, basically, uh, you can use that even without. So basically, uh, because of high parallel degree, uh, it works quite good. Um, these days, um, uh, there are three major um, input output uh, schedulers for uh, bulk MQ. Besides of uh, Depictured here, uh, Kuber and BFQ. There is a so-called um, uh, MQ uh, deadline scheduler. So the idea is uh, BFQ and uh, Kuber. Uh, BFQ is sort of CFQ for uh, bulk MQ. <laughs> if, if if it sounds difficult, the idea is uh, that is a scheduler which has uh, budgeting for different operations and base of those budgets, uh, it prioritizes uh, some operations. Uh, some people say that's a very complicated thing, it's not good to use. I would say uh, we rarely use that as well. And a uh, basic idea of Kiber was actually that it is um, uh, BFQ with all fancy mathematics striped out. So basically it's, uh, it's much easier uh, uh, scheduler which does the work more straightforward. But if uh, you use uh, recent versions of um, Linux kernel, most likely uh, your default output, input output scheduler would be MQ deadline uh, by default. And this MQ deadline uh, works uh, almost like a deadline scheduler and has the same tweaks, uh, but mm, with high parallel uh, capacities of SSD, uh, it works actually better. Just imagine that uh, airport security with uh, mm, officials who are trying to sort uh, people to maximize waiting time, uh, but uh, with lots, lots of lines of uh, uh, Rengen machines and uh, X-ray machines which are used for control. Um, despite of those uh, sorting, it would be quite efficient because there are a lot of uh, parallel capacity. A uh, good diagram on Linux IS tech uh, could be found here by Thomas Crenn and uh, this is a diagram which is not easy to put on the slides. It's large and complex and he updates that uh, quite frequently. So if you're interested in a uh, proper uh, diagram uh, with the fresh things, I, uh, I advise actually to uh, take a look there. Uh, uh, and well, it's a com complex topic. Uh, even th there it's difficult to depict uh, all the interactions between different components of that. So, uh, non-volatile memory express on VME. Uh, NVMe, it sets off standards uh, which, uh, which is a good idea. So basically, uh, modern SSDs are uh, all following the same standard in order to be managed through NVMe driver. Uh, NVMe driver for uh, Unix, uh, for Linux, is different story than NVMe driver for Windows, uh, but uh, they both are actually uh, working according to the same specification. Um, and difference is uh, as usual. So in the me for Linux was developed uh, for a long, long time with lots of decisions how to do that optimally. Uh, the Microsoft version, as far as I understand, uh, I'm th that's not that open source. That's why it, I can only guess. Um, was developed like we need to deliver soon. That's why it's like very massive driver with lots of lines of code. Uh, which has the same functionality, it was delivered very fast, but it's not probably that well maintainable. I don't know. Uh, the question which uh, uh, stays actually, are our databases uh, so NVMe ready? Because we discussed that uh, they evolved uh, like uh, Linux kernel as well uh, in order to, uh, to work with rotating disk quite a significant period of time. So what we can do now? Uh, and uh, another thing is that uh, during, uh, th that's a good example of what Linux developed to, to be NVMe aware. Um, you know, at some point, uh, the thing like IO pulling was uh, quite irrelevant because, uh, you know, uh, you perform a right operation and you wait for interruption. Uh, and that is perfectly fine if you have slow disks. But if you do um, uh, lots of uh, fast input output, output request, probably uh, to wait for the interrupt is uh, not the optimal strategy. And uh, you need to pull 
uh, your device from time to time uh, and probably get results on average faster. And that's true, uh, it's, that's how it works. Uh, because then the interruption, uh, uh, interrupt comes, it uh, would be uh, like not, not that fast. Uh, and uh, it turns out that, okay, we can uh, poll, but then uh, we use too much CPU to, uh, to poll, and that turns to be a different uh, degree of problems. And uh, Linux developers, they um, did uh, lots of uh, uh, tweaks uh, to do that polling more efficient, uh, not burning CPU so much. So uh, it was like lots of things to to adopt uh, to adapt the uh, Linux kernel for SSDs. Um, and of in terms of uh, data database, people frequently ask questions on the direct I/O. So can we do direct I/O to benefit from those uh, magic? Uh, features of SSDs, uh, especially all atomic, which is not uh, possible without or direct and so on and so on. Uh, so um, uh, the, I give you a small overview and uh, the ideas where you can learn that better. So um, currently Postgres supports direct IO only for write ahead log. Uh, and uh, it is a very interesting theoretical feature, I would say, because um, the problem is, uh, if you open the file with direct IO, uh, with a direct flag, you need to manipulate this file descriptor with uh, awareness of that it is all direct. Uh, and uh, if you open file and manipulate uh, that with uh, some program which doesn't care about uh, this flag, uh, horrible things could happen. Uh, and that's exactly the problem why uh, if you set up a uh, low level uh, to something like uh, a high for replica uh, or logical, uh, Postgres immediately switched fallbacks to to the um, normal buffer at IO for uh, write ahead log. Uh, because we have our hive command, which could be basically any arbitrary piece of the code, uh, shell or something like this, and we could not guarantee that this uh, our hive command uh, would do anything. Uh, with awareness of direct I.O. and it's unsafe to write write headlock like this. Uh, so there was experiments, but uh, it's long way. Uh, as far as I understand, the most uh, important reason was for a long time that uh, in order to implement direct I.O., uh, people need to write a lot of operating system specific code. And for Postgres was like, uh, holy grail to, to be compatible with uh, very old and very fancy uh, Linuxes, uh, Unixes, and so on for a long time. Uh, and that's why it was like unpreferable way, but uh, slowly the idea that we anyway to do, need to do the, those things to, uh, to achieve um, like right performance, uh, so right operating system specific code, uh, I, I think now it's like uh, accepted. Uh, uh, and, uh, well, um, I would say uh, most likely uh, there was lots of experiments over the last years, uh, but there is a lot of work in progress for Postgres to go in this uh, direction. And uh, I think from user side, it would be nice then some of those things would be show up to, to test it and to give feedback to the developers. So I would also suggest that um, uh, at this conference, you probably can learn uh, more detailed things uh, about the topic than from me. My, my idea was to give you some sort of overview talk to make you prepare uh, for uh, further learning and uh, to be aware that if you use NVMe, probably you already benefit from a good input output. Uh, but if you want to know uh, the proper work in progress, um, there are a couple of interesting talks uh, at this conference which you can attend. Daniel would be uh, explaining of a new uh, Postgres co-extension pgstat.io. This uh, input-output monitoring in Postgres was long time like very hacker thing because you need to use uh, system tools to diagnose the things, uh, eBPF, uh, perf, uh, things like this. Uh, you can use monitoring to 
uh, measure ordinary things like input output utilization but now in Postgres there is an extension which uh, can explain you which input output Postgres makes uh, and you can play with that and Daniel will cover how to use this thing. Uh, Tomasz, uh, Tomasz Wave uh, would uh, uh, present uh, like uh, never-ending story about uh, PostgreSQL uh, performance on various Linux file systems. Uh, it would be probably X4, but I want to keep intrigue. Uh, and if you're interested in which operating system is better uh, and how it works, it's worth of uh, coming to Tomasz talk. Uh, Anders Freund would be explaining uh, about recent development in Postgres, so a relatively large group of Postgres core hackers, including him, is working on uh, improving input output in Postgres in a modern way, uh, and they did a lot of uh, stuff uh, around this uh, last couple of years. So probably uh, this is a proper person to ask questions about uh, future of input output in Postgres. So uh, that's it for today, and I uh, want to thank you for coming, and we still have 10 minutes for questions. Uh, there is a question there. Who's asking it? Hello. <clears throat> Thanks for that. That was really good if you're running Linux on premises where you probably have a fiber channel and HBA to a, a SAN. If you're provisioning in the cloud, like an EC2 Linux instance with EBS storage, then there's not really uh, an IO path. The network looks like a network because of pair of virtualization drivers, but it's really, uh, sorry, the IO looks like IO because of pair of virtualization, but it's really a network. So in the cloud, would you think that setting the scheduler to none is the best option, which I typically see recommended? Thank you. We make DevRim run. <laughs> so uh, uh, you, you're right that it would be not that uh, beneficial like on the premises, but if you run EBS uh, volumes, uh, it also actually uses uh, bulk MQ. So at least you benefit from that part. Of course, it's network attached. There are lots of uh, bells and whistles which are providing all the flexibility of provision disks. But um, it, it would be like uh, modern infrastructure already. Uh, the only thing is, uh, from my point of view, on uh, ordinary EBS volumes like uh, general purpose, uh, not uh, input-output optimized, is really hard to benefit from uh, a high degree of uh, parallel storage. Uh, so uh, you can try to use parallel queries for that. You can uh, use um, like parallel features of uh, backup uh, of PG backrest, but uh, I rarely see that general purpose uh, EBS volumes uh, perform in their promised maximum, uh, despite of those things. Um, but if you compare, for example, with Google Cloud, where you can get uh, some general purpose uh, provisioned volumes which actually have mechanics underneath, uh, you can compare that those are much, much slower compared to Amazon's. So, but that's still applicable, the uh, short question, uh, sh short answers. Yeah. More questions? So, if no questions, thank you very much again. And, uh, yeah, M one question. <laughs> Hi, so, thank you for the talk. I, I wonder, direct IO is not used by PostgreSQL, but all others? And PostgreSQL is also very stable. I mean, if you crash it and you restart, it's working well. We have all systems and all. Uh, can direct IO impact the quality and robustness of PostgreSQL? You mentioned the deco logical decoding, but uh, you get a point? Uh, in theory, yes. <laughs> uh, in practice, uh, it's really difficult to tell because, you know, uh, with uh, such a wall level, 
Uh, you can run Postgres, you can run benchmarks, but rarely you see like really heavy loaded uh, server at the customer, uh, which really needs high I.O. So basically I never saw a uh, right ahead log written before direct in production. And I cannot say how beneficial it would be on uh, such monstrous installations. So it's yes and no. I, I, I hope it would be like very fast. And uh, other thing is uh, that uh, then it's only um, right ahead log it's probably not that beneficial because uh, you see, um, to hit uh, right ahead log, right performance in Postgres, there should be very specific workload. Most likely before that you hit the problems with uh, checkpoints, maybe with auto arco, maybe with those things. Uh, so it's right ahead log, it was, I would say it was rather experimental thing from my position uh, as a DBA. Yeah. So if no questions anymore, you can find me on the data grid booth and ask if you have questions <laughs> at some point. Thank you very much.